Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining for the Battery Insiders podcast. Today live from London from the Financial Times Future of the Car Summit here with FT Live and super delighted to have Claire, Claire Miller with us. Great to be Hi, here Simon. with you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And yeah, and you're absolute true expert in the charging space. You have a like really exciting past history as well there. You're currently an advisor, innovator, but also formerly have been a director of tech and innovation at Octopus Electric Vehicles. And we Thank actually you. know each other now for quite some time, which is time. wonderful. Yeah. And I've seen you as a battery MBA lecturer. I've seen you in your capacity at Octopus. And we see you also on lots of stages, including this one. You're going to be on the same stage again tomorrow. I will. Yeah, so excited. Morning. So excited for a bit of a, like a maybe of a teaser. I know you're going to listen to this after this event happened, but you know it's recorded before, so we're going to get I, some. I'm grateful for the warm up. <laughs> exactly. Good. You're going to get my brain working <laughs> so that in the morning I'm going to be really on it. So I appreciate it, Sam. I appreciate you coming on. And yeah, let's start on the really exciting topic of vehicle to grid, which is something I keep getting asked about it. And there's still, I think, a lot of people having lots of different opinions and questions. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to bring some of these questions with me. So. Okay. Maybe if you can just start, um, if you could just introduce what is vehicle to grid for people who maybe haven't really heard about it too much. Um, of course, there's a lot of battery enthusiasts listening here, but vehicle to grid is one of these technologies which maybe not all of them have heard about. So maybe mm. if you could start on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I'm really heartened that you're being asked about it because I feel like, um, you know, for those who do know what it is and are, are aware of it, uh, it's been coming for a long time and there's almost like a, a feeling like, will it ever come? Whereas, uh, I think there's, uh, for sure, yes, that's a spoiler alert, we'll, we'll come on to that. But actually, um, there's a much broader audience that needs to know about vehicle to grid. So it always makes me really happy to hear that folks in different parts of the industry and this is like EV ecosystem, battery ecosystem are hearing about it. So yeah, what is vehicle to grid? Ultimately, your vehicle uh, is first and foremost, a mobility asset, right? It's, it's a car, it's to move you around. It could be a van to move goods around, right? It could be a heavier vehicle, a lorry, uh, a, a, like it could be a refuse truck, it could be a school bus in the US, like there's lots of different classes, but ultimately, first of all, the vehicle has a job to do. And as we electrify those vehicles, they're gonna have batteries in them, right? When the vehicle is not being used as a car, it's often stationary. Now, for some operational vehicles, that's not true. And there are some that work incredibly intense kind of operational hours, but for most passenger vehicles, they are still stationary an awful lot of the time. And if you really think about how much you use your car, uh, there are those times when you absolutely must use it for certain things and most of the time it's parked somewhere and uh, and lots of operational vehicles have very specific routes that they drive okay so we've got vehicles that are electrified that have batteries in them that have to be cars or vehicles at some point but they are often parked at that point it's a battery on wheels and so almost you can you can flip the way you think about it and think about how that storage waiting to be used uh, perhaps that's uh, that's that's already kind of charged up storage waiting to export and then we need to think about grids um, or actually maybe we need to think about kind of grids and other uses right so for a long time v to g might be what your audience have heard about you know how do you get that energy back to the grid but actually more and more we're talking about v to x so lots of acronyms in this world but like v to x is the kind of overarching like all the use cases right it's vehicle to anything or vehicle to everything so it could be that you control that that exporting from the battery so it meets the load in your home could be that you take that and you charge another vehicle from it right could be that it goes to a building that particularly needs energy because there's been a power cut so yeah that in essence v2g v2x is about how do you get energy out of a vehicle battery at a time at a place in a way that kind of meets a use case a demand um, v2g specifically is talking about how does the energy get back to the grid and um, we can expand a bit on that but the grid piece is, could you make some money? And I think, you know, there's an energy trading piece about when you use energy, potentially when you export, you sell energy back, helps grids do more with the cables that we have in the ground right now. Um, and, you know, the other thing I think is important for the audience to know, if they don't know already, is that at different times of day, grids are, well, the whole, the whole time grids need to be in balance. So you need to have that supply and demand is in balance for the whole grid to work. But at times of day, there's a higher demand and at times of day, there's a higher generation. And so as we move to more and more renewable generation, we'll have uh, different times when there's lots of generation and, and potentially there's then there are lots of demand from you know, individuals and from businesses. How do you get enough storage into the grid to save the energy at times when it's being made in a green way? And how do you then orchestrate when that gets put back on the grid at times when the grid right now is unfortunately having to rely a lot on burning fossil fuels still. So the UK particularly has that problem. 
Um, so yeah, hopefully that's a bit of a long answer, but you know, it's about balancing the grids, got these batteries on wheels, how do they come together to enable new use cases to be met and m potentially to make some money as well to, to add to that total cost of ownership and well, ultimately reduce that total cost of ownership of a vehicle. And maximizing really the use of the battery, right, at the end of the day? Yeah, and I, and I think that's, um, from a battery audience perspective, um, you know, that's that I'm sure that folks are kind of already thinking, well, hang on a minute, yeah, this is about like a physical asset. You spend a lot of time designing, developing, manufacturing, and, and years, years and years in the making, um, not to mention those sort of mineral supply chains and, and, and all of those supply and value chains. Once you've got it embodied as a vehicle, we do not want it parked up for 90% of the day. You know, a passenger vehicle often 90% of the time is parked up, not being used. And um, I think, you know, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer, so maybe there's like a pragmatism uh, around it, but I also try to bring up that kind of empathetic layer that says, morally, we've put so much effort, intellectual, physical time, embodied in these batteries, we've got to make them work as hard as possible. It would be really wrong if we moved to this new technology and we didn't make the absolute most of it. Absolutely. And there's already some immediate questions. I will put them a bit later to the end, but just to kind of mention, I think, a big topic here, of course, self-driving. So that's maybe, is there... Oh, okay. Yeah, I've got, I've got some I've <laughs> okay, got maybe a, a utopian <laughs> view of the future. Yeah, we can okay. finish on that, maybe. Yeah, maybe on that. And then also think maybe if you even want to go technical, right? I know some of my inverter friends, there Ooh, might be like... Oh, ACDC. All of these it's things. And then also like... like story. And is it about... There we go, you know? And again, really, which ones do we want to... Is it the same kind because you do fast charging maybe on the vehicle, but your house maybe doesn't need as much power and things. So we maybe we're gonna end you're up on these very things. Expert, Simon. <laughs> I get too many questions on this topic. I told you so. Okay, great. I just remember. No, I'm I'm <laughs> I remembered all these other questions, but before that, I want to go to some other questions because you already mentioned a grid. Can't be a bit more pithy, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go there then, then, but just you already be warned. Yeah. We'll end up there. But I think for now. Talk a bit about the grid integration. You already mentioned this a bit on, on the management. And yeah, maybe like, you know, how does this fit into now this grid piece of the future? And maybe we can already start a bit on your utopian view, but maybe also where we are today <laughs> and how this moves there. Yeah, okay, so like super high level because, um, you know, around the world, like different grids work in different ways. But ultimately, we need grids to move from you know, burning fossil fuels to meet energy demand and, and a kind of hub and spoke model of generating in one place and pushing it outwards and then finding loads to take that energy which will ultimately balance it's becoming incredibly kind of uh, decentralized and a, and, and a higher and higher penetration of renewables so again in the UK uh, we have recently seen our lowest carbon intensity on the grid like in the last couple of weeks I think it was like 19 grams something 19 grams of carbon dioxide so we'll get there where there'll be a zero carbon day. And as I said before, we, we can't get there without storage because the sun doesn't always shine, not that hugely often, uh, if you compare the UK to say Australia um, or California. Um, wind doesn't always blow. We're a very windy island, which is very lucky for us. And we've heard that a bit at the show actually about you know this, this, uh, the offshore generation um, can, can be part of the mix of how we charge vehicles. So from a grid perspective, those vehicles um, are, are an energy asset. And I think that uh, if you're coming from it, if you're coming at it from an automotive perspective, it's hard to get your head around it. I think if you're coming from an energy perspective, it's easier. Um, but I think actually, if you're coming at it from a battery perspective, it's a no-brainer. And so again, I'm hoping that folks who haven't kind of come across this but are deep in the battery world will be like, this totally makes sense. It's about storing energy and exporting energy. And in a vehicle, first and foremost, that battery is designed to do that when you put your foot on the accelerator. But ultimately, this is about storing and exporting um so yeah so the grids have markets so it's you know energy itself has a, has a has a value right as a, as a tradable asset um or a tradable commodity i should say um but there's also um a kind of as a service element here and the, and the as a service is about helping grids have ways of uh of taking energy off when they need to balance and having places to store and then also being able to call up generation at times when they, they can't just turn on generation. And so I think the market element around this is, so different markets have uh, different uh, rules and different kind of ways of trading this energy. And in those markets where it's pretty deregulated and where uh, there are fluctuating prices intraday, across the day, 
and maybe further into the future, then V2G becomes a really interesting asset class. And I should also say it's not the only answer. Sometimes people feel it's an evangelism about V2G. It's part of a mix. We'll need large grid, grid scale storage. We'll need long duration storage that will be over uh, potentially multiple days. But when you're looking at that kind of four to eight hour window, EVs are already an excellent option for overnight storage. Um, when most individuals, certainly, you know, you're parked up at home or maybe in a car park somewhere, you're just charging your car overnight, right? So it's a real win-win. The V to G bit is, well, let's export some of the battery that remains at a time when the grid is really under pressure, usually in the sort of early evening when folks are coming home and starting to use electricity in their homes. Um, let's export a bit then, right? And then we can avoid having to burn fossil fuels. So there's this whole energy um, trading that's going on and V2G will play really well into that, particularly as we get to some kind of scale. Super exciting. Um, I was really excited. Later we're going to talk a bit about the implementation implication and also some real world examples. Yes. And I think there's, there's some really interesting work. I know you already have been doing in the past and you're aware of others as well. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe now if we can talk a bit about the, also the economic aspect of it, right? Yeah. An environmental aspect, you already kind of touched on this a bit again, but using the battery more, you know, having as a use it better as an asset. So maybe we can expand a bit on that. You know, for the consumer, why does this matter? Why is this a great idea also for mm -hmm. a consumer who maybe listens to that? Mm. Well, yeah, and I, you know, I think hopefully now sort of the penny sort of dropping for listeners, sort of if you hadn't heard about it before, it, it kind of makes good common sense that if, you, if you're able to drive your vehicle in the way that you need to drive it, and when you come back to your home, maybe you're lucky enough to have a driveway or maybe uh, you have uh, an on-street like parking uh, maybe you park up in a shared car park there's lots of places this will work for uh, individuals um, in a domestic kind of setting or, or you know b2c setting then it, as long as you have confidence that you'll be able to access that vehicle if you had an emergency or something happened and you needed to spontaneously use your vehicle um, you, you will you'll probably still have some state of charge left in the battery and so by setting a floor on what you're comfortable with, so often sort of 20%, 30%, um, you know, most people are not driving more than 20 miles a day. I mean, I mean that's UK, but I think, you know, broadly in, in kind of Western countries, folks are not driving many, many miles a day. And so actually you're gonna be coming coming home or back to where you park with, with a reasonably high state of charge. So even if you end up back 50 or 60% state of charge when you park, if you set a floor of 30%, if you've got a 70, 80 kilowatt hour battery pack, like 20, 30% of that is worth having for the grid. And so I think thinking about how this fits into people's lives and thinking about in practice, how do you get over that emotional, I don't know, like attachment to my my state of charge. I It's my car and you're doing something to it. I think actually it's much more about building trust than about building the tech. Because actually most people sadly are not geeky like us and don't really care. What they do care about is some reward, some benefit, and actually there are benefits to be had in terms of you know when you're part of an aggregation of batteries, okay, so when you have operators who can bring together multiple vehicles, so uh, you know, octopus energy um, would be a, an example of that, but there are others who are looking at this, um, you know, OMI, for example, um, there's uh, Axel Energy, there, there, there are multiple, I mean, there's an example in the UK market, and they're heading out into the world there are many others out there looking at how you aggregate assets and how you then sort of trade those assets. For you as an individual, it's really about trust. Do you trust that the person that you've given access to your battery will only take out um, down to say 30% of that battery? And do you trust them to charge it back up again overnight? And, and if you do trust them, then actually very quickly, it becomes a no brainer and you'll plug in and it'll be a habit, you, you plug in, and you wake up in the morning, your car's charged, and you've got this extra benefit that you had to do nothing else for. So in a world where you're doing V to G, it is a no brainer once you've actually worked out that customer trust and making the, the process itself super seamless. And again, as a geek, sad to say, but making it super easy. And, and there you go, it becomes part of your life. Amazing, I really appreciate it. And I'm definitely also interested in the economic implications when we go to real world examples. Yeah. Maybe, or if yeah. you already want to give a bit of a hint on that, like what? Well, I mean, so I led something called Powerloop, which was um, uh, in the UK, it was a government innovation um, project with some government um, funding, some match funding, and uh, with multiple um, like 
partners in our project and it was a really early project so we started well the bid was in sort of 2017 the project started 2018 and then we ran all the way through to march 2022 and um and we found you know classic project land right so so many bumps in the road also this thing called covid also this chip shortage so actually getting vehicles and getting those super early chargers was really challenging and then the integration between all of those elements was really hard it was the first time that anyone had done it so in a way like it's it's really wonderful to look back now uh on how much ground we broke and actually the learnings that we had from that we can share that now with others and that's that's fantastic but actually um from a customer perspective we gained loads of data around how people feel about interacting with the date with the technology and with those uh, services and systems so yeah that's certainly something i sort of speak from experience about the kind of you know plug in forget it just happens um and on the economic side in the uk specifically um there's a market called the balancing mechanism the balancing mechanism how our national grid transmission system maintains a balance across the market and so that's pretty lucrative and we were seeing customers behavior that would ultimately lead to um savings of 800 approximately 840 pounds this was a couple of years ago but still um, a month or uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a month oh, wow I'm just, I'm just asking Simon, <laughs> we're into, if it's a month we're going into business we're going to be rich but no i mean even yeah. so though, but as an individual sure. yeah it's really impactful and then when you think about um those market conditions actually they're market by market so country by country grid by grid there are there are different markets and they're they're changing and developing in different ways different paces so for me what's really exciting is that the technology that the vehicles the technology the batteries is just one element and then where you put them and which grids they interact with and how you build customer and commercial products and services on top of it is is is, is even more exciting in a way because once you've got that basic technology, you can start to then see what it would do. And, and the economics is really important of that. Uh, maybe we'll come onto the fleet world in a bit as well, because us as individuals, it's important to think about what do it mean for me? Wow, like £820-ish a month, um, yeah. a year. You've got me thinking <laughs> about months now, yeah. But like, that's absolutely huge in terms of a, an energy bill that might be between two and £3,000 right now in the UK. Mm. Then you translate that to fleet, bigger vehicles, many more vehicles. And businesses starting to understand that that total cost of ownership of an electric vehicle um, will very much include an element of, uh, of accessing value, which you, you can't do with a nice vehicle. You have to have a battery. Fascinating. And I think, I mean, really, I think what I found really fascinating by, you know, Octopus V and others kind of forward on offer. I mean, even you have like this kind of your car trades for your electricity. I think that got super exciting when your car's kind of charging when the electricity price are maybe even negative. Uh-huh. And then you kind of resell it back to the grid, yeah. right? When when you make money from yeah. it, so I think that's really exciting, which I think works. I mean, there's also like people maybe in the battery world, right? In the best space, we know this. Yes, so all those market signals. It's market signals. Yeah. So I think then, but it's interesting then to have like you know incorporate the car into this equation. And I think this has been yeah, super absolutely. exciting. And I think yeah. those. I think the lessons in best is really interesting. If, you know, from a battery perspective, thinking about the design parameters for batteries and what their what their primary use case is, and then there's a secondary use case. And there's a whole world here around, you know, an EV battery is designed to uh, have a certain performance characteristic as a vehicle. And then we can start to get into some really interesting stuff around, you know, it's designed to survive a certain amount of rapid charging. But we don't hear about how much rapid charging these batteries are really being designed. So folks out there who are thinking about that in your kind of design parameters, think about, you know, think about that and how that's not being spoken about. Whereas when you talk about V to X, V to G, immediately the questions come and I get hammered a lot and I think you've had quite a lot of questions probably coming in on this battery degradation using up the battery now you're an expert audience and you know that isn't how it works I'm just a mechanical engineer so I'm still very much a student of the battery chemistry but you know starting to get some maybe even some physical um, kind of mental models around gentle charging and discharging and what that does to a battery parked on a driveway where you're doing the import export for V to G and what they can do and, and maybe how that can even help with um, degradation um, or you know slow degradation i uh, fascinated if folks are working on this would love you to connect with me I'd love to learn more about what you're doing in this space versus uh, rapid charging and also versus heavy right foot we just don't talk about that a lot but in the design parameters for EVs there has to be consideration for driver behavior and uh, well we, we maybe we'll get onto autonomous in the end but I think right now we're in a really fascinating space where there's a, almost a lot of concern around V2G and what it will do to the battery without an understanding from those folks questioning of quite what goes into designing an EV battery and, and what it's designed to put up with. I think that's really interesting that there's a focus on the, the fear around V2G without really thinking about these batteries are pretty robust, right? They're designed to be driven by humans. <laughs> 
make it even more now the chemistry is right more lfp you know etc so there's I mean, yeah absolutely and, and i think that's you know i mean when we think about the original vtg you know the ogs of of this technology nissan with the leaf um i mean the nissan leaf is just yeah like we, we need the nissan leaf in all the technology museums around the world like we need to like really understand kind of all the different use cases and 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 and, and things it's unlocked and things it's sort of taught us and and the chadmo bidirectional you know protocol um, has enabled so many trials worldwide around V2G. And I, yes, I know that that technology is old. It, it will it will probably not uh, persist globally. We know it's it's kind of fallen out of favor globally. But like we, you know, it's unlocked so much and uh, and it works really well. So if you're, if you're seeing trials still using CHAdeMO, think of that as the platform on which to, to do the experimenting. It's just unlocking. Um, and those batteries, you know, they, they didn't have thermal management. Um, the the later ones are slightly better in terms of the what they have as design features, but yet they persist and they go on and on and on and they're just yeah I've so much time for the Nissan Leaf and and, and the battery and and, uh, and the Chadmo system and what it's enabled. There's, there's there's a huge there's a huge number of them out there and it'd be really fascinating again if folks are working on, you know, the the kind of the Chadmo charger, it's not going to be economically viable, probably for a for an uh, EV charger manufacturer to bring at at any kind of scale a Chadamo charger but there's a lot of Leaf and EMV 200 vans on the road so again I think there's a there's a bit of a niche there as well that for bi-directional um, yeah if anyone's feeling entrepreneurial that's a, a bit of a niche area that could be tapped maybe just one quick what's a Chadamo oh, charger sorry, for yeah, people yeah. Yep. so um, so with uh, with with EVs, you know, we need some way of charging them. Um, I'm going to talk to you about wireless at the end. Uh, but right now, the charging paradigm is uh, is physical plugging in. Uh, there's also battery swap, obviously. But I, let's just pop that to the side for a second. Although anyway, we might come to that. Um, so you need a physical charger, uh, a port, and a gun, and uh, and also to an extent some uh, interoperable communication standard between the vehicle and the charger. Chadmo um, was a, was a a, a physical charger and a comms protocol that was developed and, and really championed in Japan uh, and and really had extra focus put on it after the Fukushima disaster um, from a tsunami which really uh, undermined the Japanese grid and so uh, there was a lot of focus from the government on okay what can we do to enhance um, home by home resiliency like like building by building because there were lots of blackouts and brownouts and so actually that Chadamo is a physical charger and a physical socket in the car, and uh, and, a, and a communications protocol. It, uh, it this bidirectionality was almost by design, and or well, certainly if not original by design, then the way it kind of emerged and evolved. Um, that physical socket and charger has not been has not won out in the global kind of VHS Betamax race. And so in Europe, uh, CCS2 has been mandated, a particular arrangement of the pins and the socket, how it works together. Uh, in the US, it was CCS1, but actually Tesla came with their NACs, uh, the North American Charger Standard, uh, and convinced lots of, uh, I mean, all, all the big manufacturers in the end to go to that standard. And, uh, and so they have, a sl- they have a different shape of, ch- of charger, and then Chadamo still exists. There were a couple of others knocking around, and it's in China there's another standard, but... but Predominantly, um, yeah, Chadamo has not won out in this global race to be the preferred uh, charger, uh, sort of gun and socket and comms protocol. Great, yeah. Which is then maybe also another topic, right, of um, where we go into maybe next topic of policy and regulation, right, and kind of understanding how important that also is, kind of creating standards, but also kind of have difference ag- across regions. You already mentioned yeah. a few, looking at UK, California, Australia. Yeah, others. absolutely. Um, yeah, it's so interesting. So, so we've We've talked about the vehicles, the batteries, uh, some of the, some of the use cases, um, and and then kind of what it means to interact with a grid. But then when you go into the specifics, um, thinking about the specifics of a grid and therefore how V 2 G could work and and could be useful and therefore could make some money as well as you know help make the most of the battery and the grid we've got. Um, there's some really good examples there. So we've talked a bit about the UK, but ultimately the UK is 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 uh, probably pretty well known for having let's say pretty deregulated um, we have a price signal that changes every half an hour of the day so 48 half hourly pricing signals as well as having this market for storage and export um, we're a really windy islands in the UK and uh, you know we, we have uh, at least five of the biggest well the top five biggest offshore wind 
farms are around the UK, uh, which is a pretty cool like accolade and more will come. Um, it's often windy at night, right? So in the UK, really lucky that windy at night, car parked often at night, like match made in heaven, right? Charge your car at night, cheaper. And you alluded to like pricing or something to go negative. So it's market signals is a thing to keep in mind as we're talking about this. It, in a scenario where there's too much energy on a grid, the signal to folk to say, please turn on any kind of storage device you've got, which by the way, it doesn't have to be storage, could be demand, right? So it could be, you know, like uh, turn on a factory that's on a contract, right? Could, the, demand stroke storage. Um, to encourage people to do that and businesses to do that, then a pricing signal that goes very low or negative is uh, kind of a no brainer. So then what does that mean? When you have negative energy pricing, it means that you get paid for using and or storing energy, right? So again, really straightforward incentive. Human beings really, really incentivized by earning some money. So just have a think about that. Like you can charge your car if you had a stationary battery, if you, uh, you know, you could put your washing machine on, like just the very domestic use cases and you get paid to do it and it helps the grid. Let's think about California um, and Australia really interesting markets for different reasons so these markets have a challenge with um with how much solar they've got so their solar penetration is super high they are lucky them very warm and lovely and sunny countries and that means that there's like extremely high generation and so california has something called the duck curve which they're really now talking about the duck canyon what does that mean over a 24 hour period um you can see that the uh, the amount of, of generation on the grid it's so intense during the day where it's sunny that that they have this massive kind of uh, challenge where they go, where are we going to put all that energy during the day? Um, and so they have almost the opposite challenge we have in the UK where we have windy nights, where they have these super sunny days and Australia similarly. So in Australia, um, uh, there's there's a sort of there's an interesting growth of uh, kind of community batteries, which could be interesting to your audience. I'm sure some of them will know a lot more than me about how do you get like a community battery which can soak up some of this daytime solar off domestic roofs. And maybe then like as a community, it can be like exported back in, in the evening when people are coming home. But, uh, but, uh, but in California, uh, the regulators there are looking at, well, actually, how do we incentivize folks during the day to charge their vehicles? And that's interesting because actually cars are parked up a lot during the day. And so you've almost got the, the the inverse of what you've got in the UK, but the same kind of, you're solving the same problem, right? Which is you've got lots of generation from PV coming onto the grid and you uh, have you, you have somewhere great to store it, right? Into EVs. And then you get to choose when you export back. The other thing to say about grids where you have very high penetration of, um, of renewables, wind, solar, other, um, is that you then end up with a grid which has um, very low inertia, and this might be getting a bit too into kind of grid tech, so uh, so forgive me. And again, uh, my technical knowledge starts to run out. Suffice to say that where you have large spinning generating equipment on on a grid, uh, if parts of the grid become unstable, it gives it an inertia in the grid itself. So you have some time to uh, rectify what's going on. Where you have uh, not much spinning on the grid and you have high kind of instant export and instant load from from batteries um, and also from PV generation um, you have really low inertia so if something goes a bit wrong you don't have long to inject more into the grid before it can get kind of really out of balance so EVs in that scenario can also play a really important part in creating inertia so if you can send a signal to lots of cars at the same time to all export at the same time or all charge at the same time you can create a uh, kind of synthetic inertia which is again going to be really important in grids with high penetration so there's there's so much in grid and a lot of it I'm again a, a total student of but when we think about maximizing that battery doing the absolute most with that battery like there's 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 so many important jobs that they have to do on top of their basic job if they're in an EV of, of driving people or goods around Amazing. So this was now California, Australia as well. Yeah, I mean, Austra so Australia has a um, uh, kind of similar solar challenge, um, and then uh, they also have uh, uh, something that we don't have here yet, which is um, locational pricing. So um, in the UK, we have one price for energy. There's like a national price across the whole grid, and actually in uh, Australia, as an example, they have um, five 
like like zones um each one pretty much is matching up to uh, a state but they have a different price signal and that's quite interesting because then it's a signal to um folks who are building renewable generation or maybe to folks who are building you know services around um, smart charging EVs and V2G to say well actually the price signal coming from this zone this location is really high so let's let's actually incentivize customers here to be involved in our EV schemes charging and discharging um, so yeah so uh, so in Australia they already have that and that's driving some really interesting economic um, kind of elements and some behaviours there where you say well would we build here or there you know do we do we drive EV uptake here or there and, and what does it mean from the economics um, in the UK uh, we have something called REMA which is about the um, review of uh, energy market arrangements uh, and that will deliver in the next few months into year um, probably a locational pricing signal um, and again that kind of makes sense if you know the UK market we have a lot of uh, onshore wind in sort of Scotland and the border between Scotland and England but we don't have a densely populated area there and we have a lot of our industries further south and so actually to encourage uh, the the uh, the use of that energy having a signal that said if you can like store lots of energy near this wind we've on, onshore wind we've already built um, that's going to be a good thing for the grid versus if you can uh, incentivize uh, anyone that can kind of store and then export where there's a high demand at certain times. So again, V2G could play a big part in that for customers who live in certain really grid congested parts of the country where you say, well, actually, you happen to live in this bit of the country. The grid's really congested. The price signal is going to be super high. You'll, you can earn actually more than a person living somewhere else if you can export at certain times. So we're not there yet. But there are these really interesting economic factors, and it, and it, certainly I would keep an eye on the UK, Australia, California, and also the other one is ERCOT, which is Texas. The Texas grid is an island; it is not interconnected. And anyone who saw what happened in Texas 18 months ago now, maybe two years ago, where they they had a, a very unusually cold spell, and the um, traditional energy generating equipment froze. Um, there is again a kind of generation in the north demand in the south type of scenario there which is also really fascinating so there's a really interesting grid to keep an eye on and how batteries in vehicles and like best grid scale batteries play into that it's like it's it now is the moment it's super exciting you know it's really really interesting to see these batteries deployed in those markets kind of doing good for people and doing good for people's for investors as well so amazing and then maybe also i think you already brought up this this country so now from like a hands-on, you know, ex your experience working on that, because I think that's something really fascinating that you have. Again, a lot of people maybe read about it now and they're curious, but you actually have hands-on experience with vehicle to grid. Yeah. So maybe some of your lessons from that, or also other things you have seen around, which I find really fascinating. Yeah. Um, so uh, leading um, this project, um, it was called Power Loop. Um, uh, uh, it was a real challenge at the start to get the technology, and I say we we ended up using Nissan Leaf um, and a charger, um, which was compatible although you know on, on reflection those charges were still super early um but we were you know, we were proving out some of these use cases and learning about how customers kind of use the, the technology and i'm very lucky that well lucky stroke it was what we needed to do to get the project done that i had that equipment it's all at my home and so i've lived with vtg for many years actually and and, and that in itself is a huge privilege um but I have been the person who's left themselves with no battery in the morning because I exported it all and then there was a glitch and it didn't charge back up and stuff. So I've certainly kind of lived that challenging scenario where you lose trust in the tech because actually you promised that my car would be ready in the morning and it wasn't. So yeah, I've got some first-hand experience of what that feels like and then what you need to do to ensure that you don't end up in that situation. Um, there are some uh, really interesting uh, pilots into kind of production coming around the world so the US there's a real focus on school buses and electrifying school buses in the US is, is, a, is the focus of huge um, government grants um, and in the US and and kind of technological focus and again those vehicles drive a particular route once a day and then they park up for many hours um, so that's something that's really interesting to look at is the electrification of school buses I mean just generally that's quite an interesting use case and then you know, the duty cycle of that vehicle is, you know, it's a heavy vehicle, it's carrying passengers, the battery has to be designed for a certain kind of operational window. 
but once it's parked up what do you do with it so that's actually that's quite interesting um and then i don't know more more, more case studies are interesting yeah so okay so so something i've been working on in the uk for about 18 months now is with a startup company called electric green and electric green have uh, a kind of absolutely breakthrough wireless charging technology um, which also incorporates the onboard um, charger so there's a we haven't really talked about like where do you do the ac to dc dc to ac bit so maybe i'll talk a little bit about that um and in that sense they're doing inductive charging wireless charging right which in itself is challenging and you know people feel it's like you know it's it's in the future but it's a long way in the future uh, i often think it's there's a lot of losses associated but actually they are at the stage now where those losses are comparable to ac charging so in the sort of efficiencies in the mid to high 90s so so it's, it's definitely there in terms of the efficiency um and in certain use cases it's uh, kind of it's going to revolutionize how we electrify vehicles uh, before we get to the bi-directional per- part so um so yeah so i've been a, a long time advisor to that business and we've got to uh, the point now where we're uh, tr- going to trial with royal mail so the postal operator in the uk um putting these electric uh, these wireless um, electric charging systems on their vehicles as a retrofit at this stage um, although obviously during production is going to be ideal so any tier one folks out there that want to have a conversation we'd absolutely love to talk to you um, and actually bringing together that wireless charging and this sort of onboard charger so the inverter on the vehicle enables those post vans to be bi-directional whenever they're parked and I think that's also something really important to keep in mind is actually it's about opportunity Right? It's the opportunity of being able to uh, export that energy at a time when the grid needs it and when the market signal is there. So hopefully that getting this idea of like, this is a fleet of vehicles that have a job to do. They have to go and deliver like post, they're delivering parcels and, and letters, but they go out in the morning and they come back in the afternoon and then they park and then they're there overnight until the morning. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a, for me, that's one of the most sort of, yeah, like sexy and exciting kind of projects to be involved in where you go, this is so cool. It's like wireless charging, which are already pretty cool and it's bi-directional. And so you're, you're enabling any opportunity you can to use that battery. It always is. So you haven't got to remember to plug it in. You haven't got to be careful not to run over the plug, which happens a lot in depots and depots often very tight for space. So yeah, that's one of the ones I'm like most proud of and excited to be involved in but like there's there's an awful lot kind of broadly around this so we talk about hgvs like a lot of hgvs uh don't get used 24 hours a day and so being able to kind of sweat that asset um with bi-directionality that's that is coming as well absolutely and they're big big batteries in those because they're big beasts they've got a lot of stuff to haul right so that's quite exciting the conversation i'm having now with kind of the freight world um I'm trying to think of some other interesting examples of this. I mean, I think, I think also you can think really broadly and say, like, where are batteries being used and how are batteries being put to best effect? And actually, fleet, again, we think about passenger vehicles. They, they're, they're ubiquitous in our lives and they're cool and sexy and, the, and the, the, the coolest ones are super cool. But actually, fleet, I find quite sexy and exciting because the batteries there have an operational duty cycle to meet. Um, but there's all this, this other there's other opportunities as well around V2G, and so yeah, I, there's there's a, there's an awful lot that these batteries uh, can do, and we can do so much more with them. Fascinating. And then now I think I want to come back to some of the early questions, kind of I brought up. So, mm. a bit of devil's advocate now. Oh for God, the final. Okay, okay, okay. Brace, <laughs> brace. So everyone is everyone is excited. I now how hyped up V2G. Um, another topic, I mean, here also, right, I think here, the future of the car event we have been talking about is v- self-driving. Of course, it's, it's okay, a big yeah. topic. And we spoke about, I mean, you already now brought alternatives, maybe with the fleet, etc. But if you think about, you know, passenger vehicles, and now we go into a utopian world, or maybe not a utopian, depending who you ask, <laughs> and every vehicle is uh, fully self-driving. So then, and it's shared, so, you know, it's completely, you know, always used. Vehicles, we don't have individual vehicles, or we share them, or whatever might happen. Does it still make sense then to do vehicle to grid? Yeah, well, I, mean, I think it makes even more sense actually. Mm-hmm. So when you think about, you know, you have a you have a, a fleet of vehicles that are self-driving. Um, that I think it also brings in the wireless element actually because you know those vehicles will uh, be used a lot of the time, but there will be times when they're not being used and they will have to park up and charge. And so there's an element there which says, well, if you orchestrate where they charge and when they charge and how they charge with the grid signal you can absolutely maximize the benefit because you don't have these pesky humans in the way uh you can you can plan for it and they become much more of an operational fleet than an individual mobility asset so that's really important i think to think about is that fleet you know they become like fleet thinking so you can 
you can then start to use, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stop myself saying uh, machine learning and AI, um, but I'm going to say it. Like you can start to use some learning there, machine learning around where do they go, how do they go, and then you can start to plan how you charge them. And ultimately, if there's any state of charge left, how do you export them? Um, th there's also that element about the uh, moving energy around in space as well as time. And I think that's something that uh, I don't hear a lot about, but um, but I think we should talk about it more and more, which is uh, when you have an autonomous vehicle, I mean, y we have it now, but when we have an autonomous vehicle, um, it starts to really unlock this opportunity, which is uh, if there's a particular price signal in a particular place, so we mentioned about, you know, locational pricing is coming like we won't have this one national signal in the uk we'll have locational pricing as those signals start coming online and they become more and more granular and we haven't even talked about the distribution network operators who are the folks who look after the cables from the national level all the way down to your building to your home um uh, as as they start to send pricing signals these vehicles when they're not being used as vehicles can take themselves and their battery and the state of charge they have remaining and go and export energy at a place where it will help the grid or go and charge at a place where it will help the grid. So we've never seen that, right? That's that's a totally new concept is moving a, an energy storage or an energy exporting device around physically in the world, maybe at certain times. And so my utopia that I was sort of alluding to at the beginning is, you know, and, and this is maybe not well, certainly not in the next few years, but we'll, we'll see in our lifetime. You know, I, I can envisage um, a kind of a flock. I prefer flock. Some people say swarm, and I think that sounds really negative. So a flock, a flock of autonomous, you know, driving pods that, when they're not being driven by humans, uh, all make their way to a certain physical location and make their batteries available to export or to import to support the grid to absolutely maximise the cables that we have in the ground. And uh, that shouldn't preclude them being used as vehicles albeit autonomous, but there is a whole world of opportunity of, of new ways of thinking about how we move energy in space in these batteries and we move storage in space in terms of these, you know, semi, you know, full or, or, or almost empty batteries. And I think that is a, is a really important place for smart people to put their, their intellectual kind of power to think about what that what does that mean then for how we design batteries how we fit them in vehicles um and how do we interact with them in our day-to-day -day. Oh, fascinating i think yeah really like an agile decentralized grid mm -hmm. we're already talking with wind and solar and then i mean even i know it was trained there's discussions around that topic so i think i, I love i mean i'm curious to see as you say how this utopia are gonna play out and what we're gonna see in, in, in well, we'll get back together here in like 20 years and we'll <laughs> reflect <laughs> back yeah. on uh, what our predictions if they're so right then I guess it's gonna like be the 30th anniversary of this event it's been oh, I love 10th that. anniversary yes. right now yeah so. nice that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah excellent <laughs> okay I love so that so let's uh, you know, we hope we'll be, be back exactly us in. <laughs> invite us back um, <laughs> well, that's fantastic maybe just one other topic as well because I found it really fascinating I've been asked about is the inverter topic and you already brought okay, it up and yeah on the vehicle and I think so one is kind of you know what you've seen there and with kind of maybe some of the trends right now are from an inverter perspective and of course they're not so cheap and for when it makes sense to bring it on yeah. board when maybe separate and then also this topic of you have different kind of demand right from a vehicle versus maybe a household so maybe a household requires less power if you're going to require more mm -hmm. I can you optimize it for both what's the kind of yeah. status there yeah right no now? Re really good question I think it's really important we're Again, we're moving out of this like early trial um, world where we pretty much only had the Nissan Leaf. And the Nissan Leaf requires uh, an inverter to be in the charger separate to the vehicle. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that you know the battery um, wants to uh, ingest DC, for want of a better term. And so we take that alternating grid from the current through someone's home or through a building, um, needs to go you know, through the charger, gets turned into, into DC for, um, well, there are there are there are differing like protocols even there, but let's 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 accept that you know the battery will then ingest DC, um, and then with the Chadmo system, uh, the car itself doesn't have a way of turning that DC back into AC on the vehicle, and then you need that inverter to be in the charger um, to make it back into AC to go back into the home onto the grid. Now, uh, again, you know for international kind of listeners, like yes, there are some places that have or are exploring DC microgrids. Uh, they're not very widespread um, and for now anyway you know most domestic uh, wiring is AC and so our, our kettles and our microwaves and our, and our washing machines and all of our kind of like white goods they all run off AC okay so so 
we've seen some vehicle manufacturers talk for quite a long time and and work hard for quite a long time around uh, that that kind of paradigm where on the car it would be exporting DC and you'd have to deal with that inversion somewhere off board. Um, so VW is an example of that. They've for a long time been working uh, on uh, the ID uh, range of vehicles. And in fact, yeah, Future of the Car, we heard earlier from uh, from you know, VW about their, their that ID platform is their first kind of foray into EVs. Um, what does that mean? Well, that, that means that they're hoping and working hard towards a software upgrade on the vehicle, which will enable the communications to say, you know, the, the, the DC can go in this direction as well as that direction, but it still needs a charger that has an inverter. What that means is that the cost, uh, the, the size, the weight, the heat of that inversion stage is borne by uh, in a domestic setting a customer and they're big and bulky because they get hot and uh, and you need to dissipate that heat and um, and expensive in terms of like a standalone inverter item uh, so personally I find it hard to envisage a world where there's enough money to be made in grid interaction to even meet the cost of a charger which again it these aren't these aren't scaled products right now right so it's hard to say but anywhere three four five thousand pounds maybe so you aren't going to make that money even if you're making 800 pounds a year you're not going to make that money back for, for for a long time right so your return on investment starts to look not as attractive as a, as a customer mm. um i think for fleets and larger vehicles dc based systems will actually will be quite interesting because you it's an operational asset it's there to be kind of sweated for one again a better word and so having you know installed infrastructure that multiple vehicles can use i think that could be interesting for dc i think also over dc you know because you can uh, charge and discharge faster there might be opportunities to um to store and then export energy into different markets because some of these markets they require you to be available to to, to give a very short notice a quite large export for example so dc could i think will be very interesting in the fleet world from a domestic perspective, the alternative, well, the alternative, regardless, is AC, where on the vehicle there is this AC to DC and DC back to AC, uh, which is an upgrade to the existing onboard charger. What does that mean? Well, as a customer, as a domestic customer, that means that the charger you need is going to require uh, an upgrade to the power electronics. So much cheaper, much more simple. It's still an AC charger. It just has a concept now and it has the, the semiconductors uh, to cope with AC moving in one way and then out the other way, which puts them in the similar ballpark to an AC charger these days. Um, so what are we talking there? 500 to 1,000 um, pounds. And the, the complication becomes far less complicated in terms of this bi-directional inverter because then it becomes a tier one supplier challenge to upgrade their parts and actually, it's really fascinating when you talk to the tier one suppliers and to and to innovators like um, Electric Green, where you where you look at it and, and and they can say, well, it's not the work of a moment, but it's not a massive technological leap, and it's certainly not a massive cost on to this part. So, what do I think? I think that uh, onboard bidirectional inverters will become uh, available and then commonplace and then standard in the same way that things like um, air conditioning. Uh, electric windows. I don't know if you're if you're old enough to remember the wind down window. I remember my mum saying, "I'm like, mum, we're going to have electric windows." She's like, "They're far too expensive. Just make this noise." Eee. So, like, you know, uh, we are going to see that coming through, um, uh, but it will take a bit of time. And so, what does that mean in terms of the AC system? Well, then it becomes, I mean, not a no brainer, but it comes pretty straightforward. If you've got a home and a driveway, or you've got a public charger where you can safely leave your vehicle, or um, yeah, any kind of like on street or munis municipal charging where it has a bi directional charger and the right comms, then your car, again, a bit like the, you know, it, it's the start of that um, autonomous utopia that I was talking about, which is you can move your car around and you can export energy if you if you want to uh, and charge it where you want to and it becomes a much more useful kind of asset than just a car so an example there actually is to um, to look at what's happening in Utrecht um, where they are uh, the world's first bi-directional city and uh, and they have 700 on-street AC bi-directional chargers and they're running proprietary software on the charger and proprietary so software on the vehicles, which are predominantly uh, Hyundai, oh, Hyundai, sorry, I have to say it properly, we're out the future of the car, um, Hyundai um, Ionic 5s. And, 
uh, and I am I'm reliably informed that this year into next, they'll start to get production vehicles from a range of manufacturers, and they're going to increase that from 700 to 2,500 on-street AC bi-directional chargers. So democratizing access to vehicle-to-grid, which in turn gives access to those benefits to customers who don't necessarily have a driveway, um, with shared vehicles and, and sort of carpooling and car sharing, just doing more with that battery, right? Doing more with that battery helps drivers, helps customers, uh, ultimately helps the grid, and everyone should share a bit in that benefit. So, uh, so yeah. So for me, AC, it, certainly in terms of passenger vehicles, is is the way that it should go, and hopefully is the way that it will go. Amazing, clear. Absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Really, really appreciate these insights. I could talk to you much longer, so there's I a lot I of other hope, things. I hope it's been interesting <laughs> because I feel like I've, I've got a very long answer. So thanks everyone no, for really sticking with me and, and the long explanations. I really appreciate you you're coming on. I think some really valuable insights. And also please feel free to put into the comments as well if you have any other questions, maybe of opposing views. That's also really appreciated. It would be great to get this dialogue going. So please go into the comment section if you wish and give us your thoughts as well. Um, yeah, I also want to thank you know FT and the FT Live to have us here on the Future of the Car Summit. Absolutely fascinating event in London. Wonderful to be with Battery Associates as a supporting partner again. Um, and yeah, if you're interested to listen to more podcasts, you can go on Battery Insiders on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or also YouTube, anywhere to listen to your podcasts. My name is Dr. Simon Engelke, founder and chair of Battery Associates, and really appreciate you tuning in today. And we talk very soon. Thanks, there. Thank